Our body is made up of trillions of cells that contain our own DNA. However, there are even more cells that originated from outside our bodies that are currently living within us, serving several important functions. The human gut contains the highest density of microorganisms in the whole human body, and collectively, these organisms are referred to as the gut microbiome. This video will take a look at what the gut microbiome is and explore how learning more about it could potentially hold the key to understanding and treating many different gastrointestinal diseases. This video has been made in consultation with Dr. Nikhil Pai, who is an associate professor in the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology and the medical lead of the Complex Pediatric Nutrition Services at McMaster Children's Hospital. He is also a principal investigator studying the role of the intestinal microbiome in gastrointestinal health and disease. Let us first hear from him about what exactly the gut microbiome is and the nature of the relationship between us and these bacteria. So what the, the gut um, the microbiome or microbiota is, is it's sort of like this, uh, this parasite, you could say, but probably more like a, like a parasite that has like this symbiotic relationship with us thanks to various things that we give that bacteria and the fungi and the viruses in our intestines, uh, largely through way of food by eating ourselves. All of those things get processed by the gut microbiota, um, all the different bacteria and viruses and organisms, and they produce their own proteins and metabolites. And sometimes those proteins, metabolites get absorbed by us and actually end up influencing our own bodies. It helps us um, have our normal physiology thanks to some of its functions, thanks to the contributions we give it, and ultimately kind of controls the way that we experience health and disease. The importance of a healthy microbiome often gets overlooked. However, when improperly balanced and left in an unhealthy state, it's hard to ignore the pain and illness as a result. Within our gut, there exist both good and bad microbes. Typically, these cohabit in balance and create a symbiotic relationship within us. Microbes are able to perform important metabolic and immune functions. However, if this balance is disturbed, dysbiosis occurs, which may cause weight gain, inflammation, and allergic responses. Though, in more drastic cases, it can also lead to diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, and cancer. So what does an expert classify as a healthy microbiome? A healthy microbiome is one that's diverse and rich, and that makes it a little bit more resilient to outside stresses. However, the creation of a healthy gut microbiome can be slightly more challenging to predict. This is because individually, we all have unique microbiomes of over 100 trillion microbes, of which the ratios of such microbes depend on factors including genetics, environmental factors, medication, exercise, and diet. If the microbiome is supposed to be sort of like an ecosystem, and I think we can all agree, like when you look at like the Amazon rainforest or something that's like very like rich and diverse, probably when you have a lot of different species, of a lot of different kinds, they're able to kind of be referees for each other and keep things in check. So, so maybe when you have too much bacteria of any one particular type, then it can run a little rampant and that can potentially be a problem. This whole idea of like the diverse ecosystem, the rainforest, oh, it's so like beautiful and rich and all the rest. But then you realize that actually, even though there's a couple of bacterial species that are in very low abundance relative to everything else, they are super metabolically active and they're like these keystone species. They're, they're very, very rare. But if you don't have those, the entire system goes awry. The gut microbiome also interacts closely with the host immune system, where many autoimmune diseases have been linked to certain gut microbiome profiles. The gut microbiome sort of piggybacks the immune system and assists in immune responses to fight off disease. A strong immune response to fight off diseases requires energy. This energy depends on your metabolism. Think of your metabolism as a campfire. To fuel this fire, you add logs, or in this case, food. And during this process, you make other intermediate chemicals called metabolites, which assist in the making of this fire. Microbes make immune responses smoother with their ability to contribute these metabolites and fight off disease with ease. Though, despite all efforts to maintain a healthy microbiome, some diseases and conditions can still persist. IBS, or irritable bowel syndrome, is one of the most widespread disorders of the gut resulting in uncomfortable symptoms of gas, painful cramps, and abnormal bowel movements. More severe, Crohn's disease is a type of irritable bowel disease, which is characterized by inflammation of the digestive tract, usually the small intestine, and results in severe diarrhea, fatigue, 
weight loss, and malnutrition from insufficient nutrient absorption. It is not yet known what exactly causes Crohn's disease, but scientists believe that an individual's immune response, genetics, and environment all play a key role in the severity of Crohn's disease. Individuals with IBS, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's have different microbiome profiles compared to healthy individuals. It has been established that the microbiome plays a large role in overall gut health and the outcomes of Crohn's disease. But how do we alter the composition of bacteria within the gut? Um, some of the ways that we've tried to affect the bacteria and, and just try to change it up is through antibiotics, um, getting rid of things, probiotics, giving more of something, but in limited quantities, and probably like the sledgehammer approach, fecal microbiota transplant, where you give just a huge volume of healthy bacteria from at least a healthy donor who doesn't have Crohn's disease. Hopefully that's as healthy as you get and you just change things up. And that's kind of the third way that you can try and uh, use microbial treatments. Fecal transplants are a way to alter the composition of one's microbiome. They involve the transfer of stool from one organism to another, where stool is transferred into the gastrointestinal tract. Fecal transplants have been extremely useful for resolving Clostridium difficile infections, and they have also been linked to having positive results with sclerosis, increasing insulin sensitivity, and treating individuals with Crohn's disease. Fecal transplants are an effective way to replace bad bacteria that may be causing complications with healthy bacteria. So I think that's the kind of goal number one. When you do this, can you somehow take a child who is having like fulminant symptoms and just get them feeling better? Fine. Um, and that really was the, the state of where we were. Like we, we were the first um, group to, to do a trial of this in children um, worldwide. Step two and three, though, is now saying, like, well, what are we doing? So, so we were able to show effect and, and these kids got better. So now what is it that's changing? And I think the value of that is also to take this to the next level. If we can say what's changing and more importantly, what consistently changes between like you both had an FMT, both of you got better. And hey, incidentally, these same bacteria that were there in both of you when you felt terrible are now gone. Maybe that's a clue right? Maybe those bacteria were the ones that were causing problems. It does seem that there are certain bacteria that tend to be um, more pathogenic, and one term is pathobionts in Crohn's disease um, that, that present themselves. The, the flip side, though, is also replenishing, as we said, bacteria that tend to be less um, abundant in, in these situations. And amongst them, they're often ones that produce certain metabolites that are beneficial. So such as short chain fatty acid producing bacteria. Short chain fatty acids are great in normal, like everyday state of physiology, and incidentally tend to be depleted in patients who have active Crohn's disease. So if we can try and give back those bacteria that are short chain fatty acid producers, that may be good. But going back though, to the earlier thing we said, you know, it's kind of like a, like a, a big auditorium or like, like this library. If, if there's no, if there's so many other uh, loud, rowdy people who are taking up chairs, you need to get rid of those first. If, if the healthy um, short chain fatty acid producing bacteria are able to take up residence without being shouldered out and, and kept out of, out of being able to take up residence. So essentially what's called filling a microbial niche. So I think that's where FMT aims to do a little bit of both. Get enough of the, the good bacteria in that they can not only um, dominate in terms of number, but also hopefully shoulder out the more pathogenic organisms as well. Fecal transplants can vary in length. However, more research is still needed in order to improve treatment options. Dr. Pai explains how the number of transplants may differ amongst different patients. We were giving 12 treatments um, over the span of six weeks. Um, we, we, our trial is one of the more frequent ones that have been done in the patient, but it still seemed that after 12 treatments, we had a time point that went up to 30 weeks. There were some patients who did well up until 30 weeks, but then they started to show symptoms again. So I think the issue is that like, for some reason, um, the microbiome tends to kind of bounce back to its kind of pathologic state in many, many patients. 
Although fecal transplants can be effective, there are still some limitations regarding their application and the number of transplants needed. There's been some thought that maybe FMT doesn't work so well in people who are super sick, who have really severe disease. I guess I challenge that a little bit though, because if you think about like the messy details of how FMT is done, you're like putting this liquid that has like a lot of healthy bacteria or a capsule sometimes into someone and hoping that it gets absorbed and sticks. When you're really sick with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, everything you take in is just pouring right through you. So maybe it's not so much that they don't, they, they, you know, it's not going to work, but you need to treat them more frequently at the beginning. And if only 10% of what I gave managed to stick, 90% just went right down the toilet. Eventually, 10% is going to become 30 because that's that uh, really like leaky sponge. It's going to start to absorb things better. And then gradually it's going to become less and less frequent because what you've given them is staying. So, so maybe going back to your question, if you have milder disease, perhaps you don't need to give it as frequently, but when you are not doing so well, you have to give a few back-to-back -back treatments. Fecal transplants also pave the way for bacterial infection treatments and can pose as a viable option to reduce antibiotic use. They can serve as a useful tool, especially with the emerging issue of antibiotic resistance. Fecal transplants also transmit various fungi and viruses, like bacteriophages and eukaryotic viruses, which impact the transplant's efficacy. Host factors such as an individual's age, diet, and genetics can affect the efficacy of the transplant and the type of transplant used. Though difficult to predict, a healthy microbiome can most easily be regulated by diet. Eating fermented foods like yogurt or prebiotic foods like bananas, asparagus, and oats, as well as incorporating diverse types of foods high in fiber, such as legumes and beans, can be beneficial. Overall, Fecal microbiota transplants serve as an effective and viable option to alter gut bacteria that may be associated with Crohn's disease. Further research can explore the implementation and effects of fecal transplants on patient health.